Section 34 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 34. Selected Works by Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno, 1548 to 1600. Filippo Bruno, known as Giordano Bruno, was born at Nola, near Naples, in 1548. This was eight years after the death of Copernicus, whose system he eagerly espoused, and ten years before the birth of Bacon, with whom he associated in England. Of an ardent poetic temperament, he entered the Dominican order in Naples at the early age of sixteen, doubtless attracted to conventional life by the opportunities of study it offered to an eager intellect. Bruno had been in the monastery nearly thirteen years when he was accused of heresy in attacking some of the dogmas of the church. He fled first to Rome and then to northern Italy, where he wandered about for three seasons from city to city, teaching and writing. In 1579 he arrived at Geneva, then the stronghold of the Calvinists. Coming into conflict with the authorities there on account of his religious opinions, he was thrown into prison. He escaped and went to Toulouse, at that time the literary center of southern France, where he lectured for a year on Aristotle. His restless spirit, however, drove him on to Paris. Here he was made professor extraordinary at the Sorbonne. Although his teachings were almost directly opposed to the philosophic tenets of the time, attacking the current dogmas, and Aristotle, the idol of the schoolmen, Yet such was the power of Bruno's eloquence and the charm of his manner that crowds flocked to his lecture room, and he became one of the most popular foreign teachers the university had known. Under pretense of expounding the writings of Thomas Aquinas, he set forth his own philosophy. He also spoke much on the art of memory, amplifying the writings of Raymond Lully. And these principles, formulated by the monk of the 13th century, and taken up again by the freethinkers of the 16th, are the basis of all the present-day mnemonics. But Bruno went even further. He attracted the attention of King Henry III of France, who in 1583 introduced him to the French ambassador to England, Castelnuovo di Montvissier. Going to London, he spent three years in the family of this nobleman, more as friend than dependent. They were the happiest, or at least the most restful years of his stormy life. England was just then entering on the glorious epoch of her Elizabethan literature. Bruno came into the brilliant court circles, meeting even the Queen, who cordially welcomed all men of culture, especially the Italians. The astute monk reciprocated her goodwill by paying her the customary tribute of flattery. He won the friendship of Sir Philip Sidney, to whom he dedicated two of his books, and enjoyed the acquaintance of Spencer, Sir Fulcoville, Dyer, Harvey, Sir William Temple, Bacon, and other wits and poets of the day. At that time, somewhere about 1580, Shakespeare was still serving his apprenticeship as playwright, and had perhaps less claim on the notice of the observant foreigner than his elder contemporaries. London was still a small town where the news of the day spread rapidly, and where, no doubt, strangers were as eagerly discussed as they are now within narrow town limits. Bruno's daring speculations could not remain the exclusive property of his own coterie. And as Shakespeare had the faculty of absorbing all new ideas afloat in the air, he would hardly have escaped the influence of the teacher who proclaimed in proud self-confidence that he was come to arouse men out of their theological stagnation. His influence on Bacon is more evident, because of their friendly associations. Bruno lectured at Oxford, but the English university found less favor in his eyes than English court life. Pedantry had indeed set its fatal mark on scholarship, not only on the continent, but in England. Aristotle was still the god of the pedants of that age, and dissent from his teaching was heavily punished, for the dry dust of learning blinded the eyes of the scholastics to new truths. Bruno, the knight-errant of these truths, devoted all his life to scourging pedantry, and dissented in toto from the idol of the schools. No wonder he and Oxford did not agree together. He wittily calls her the widow of sound learning, and again, a constellation of pedantic, obstinate ignorance and presumption, mixed with a clownish incivility that would tax the patience of Job. He lashed the shortcomings of English learning in La Cena delle Ceneri, Ash Wednesday conversation. But Bruno's roving spirit, 
and perhaps also his heterodox tendencies drove him at last from england and for the next five years he roamed about germany leading the life of the wandering scholars of the time always involved in conflicts and controversies with the authorities always antagonistic to public opinion flying in the face of the most cherished traditions he underwent the common experience of all prophets the minds he was bent on awakening refused to be aroused finally he was invited by zuone mocenigo of venice to teach him the higher and secret learning the venetians supposed that bruno with more than human erudition possessed the art of conveying knowledge into the heads of dullards disappointed in this expectation he quarrelled with his teacher and in a spirit of revenge picked out of bruno's writings a mass of testimony sufficient to convict him of heresy this he turned over to the inquisitor at venice bruno was arrested convicted and sent to the inquisition in rome when called upon there to recant he replied i ought not to recant and i will not recant he was accordingly confined in prison for seven years then sentenced to death on hearing the warrant he said it may be that you fear more to deliver this judgment than i to bear it on february seventeenth sixteen hundred he was burned at the stake in the campo dei fiori at rome he remained steadfast to the end saying i die a martyr and willingly his ashes were cast into the tiber two hundred and fifty-nine years afterwards his statue was unveiled on the very spot where he suffered and the italian government is bringing out eighteen ninety six the first complete edition the national edition of his works in their substance bruno's writings belong to philosophy rather than to literature although they are still interesting both historically and biographically as an index of the character of the man and of the temper of the time many of the works have either perished or are hidden away in inaccessible archives for two hundred years they were tabooed and as late as eighteen thirty six forbidden to be shown in the public library of dresden he published twenty-five works in latin and italian and left many others incomplete for in all his wanderings he was continually writing as the work of the great key the exploration of the thirty seals etc the first extant work is il candelaggio the taper a comedy which in its license of language and manner vividly reflects the time in the dedication he discloses his philosophy time takes away everything and gives everything the spaccio della bestia triunfante expulsion of the triumphant beast the most celebrated of his works is an attack on the superstitions of the day a curious medley of learning imagination and buffoonery degli eroici furori the heroic enthusiasts is the most interesting to modern readers and in its majestic exaltation and poetic imagery is a true product of italian culture bruno was evidently a man of vast intellect and of immense erudition his philosophic speculations comprehended not only the ancient thought and that current at his time but also reached out toward the future and the result of modern science he perceived some of the facts which were later formulated in the theory of evolution the mind of man differs from that of lower animals and of plants not in quality but only in quantity each individual is the resultant of innumerable individuals each species is the starting point for the next no individual is the same today as yesterday not only in this divination of coming truth is he modern but also in his methods of investigation reason was to him the guide to truth in a study of him Luz says bruno was a true neapolitan child as ardent as its soil as capricious as its varied climate there was a restless energy which fitted him to become the preacher of a new crusade urging him to throw a haughty defiance in the face of every authority in every country an energy which closed his wild adventurous career at the stake he was distinguished also by a rich fancy a varied humour and a chivalrous gallantry which constantly remind us that the intellectual athlete is an italian and an italian of the sixteenth century a discourse of poets from the heroic enthusiasts cicada say what do you mean by those who vaunt themselves of myrtle and laurel Tanzillo, those may and do boast of the myrtle who sing of love if they bear themselves nobly they may wear a crown of that plant consecrated to venus of which they know the potency those may boast of the laurel who sing worthily of things pertaining to heroes substituting heroic souls for speculative and moral philosophy 
praising them and setting them as mirrors and exemplars for political and civil actions. Chicada. There are then many species of poets and crowns. Tansilo. Not only as many as there are muses, but a great many more. For although genius is to be met with, yet certain modes and species of human ingenuity cannot be thus classified. Chicada. There are certain schoolmen who barely allow Homer to be a poet, and set down Virgil, Ovid, Marshall, Hesiod, Lucretius, and many others as versifiers, judging them by the rules of poetry of Aristotle. Tansilo. Know for certain, my brother, that such as these are beasts. They do not consider that those rules serve principally as a frame for the Homeric poetry and for others similar to it, and they set up one as a great poet, high as Homer, and disallow those of other vein and art and enthusiasm, who in their various kinds are equal, similar, or greater. Chicada, so that Homer was not a poet who depended upon rules, but was the cause of the rules, which serve for those who are more apt at imitation than invention, and they have been used by him who, being no poet, yet knew how to take the rules of Homeric poetry into service, so as to become not a poet or a Homer, but one who apes the muse of others. Tansilo, thou dost well conclude that poetry is not born in rules, or only slightly and accidentally so. The rules are derived from the poetry, and there are as many kinds and sorts of true rules as there are kinds and sorts of true poets. Chicada, how then are the true poets to be known? Tansilo, by the singing of their verses. In that singing they give delight, or they edify, or they edify and delight together. Chicada. To whom then are the rules of Aristotle useful? Tansilo. To him who, unlike Homer, Hesiod, Orpheus, and others, could not sing without the rules of Aristotle, and who, having no muse of his own, would coquette with that of Homer. Chicada. Then they are wrong, those stupid pedants of our days, who exclude from the number of poets those who do not use words or metaphors conformable to, or whose principles are not in union with, those of Homer and Virgil, or because they do not observe the custom of invocation, or because they weave one history or tale with another, or because they finish the song with an epilogue on what has been said, and a prelude on what is to be said, and many other kinds of criticism and censure, from whence it seems they would imply that they themselves, if the fancy took them, could be the true poets." And yet, in fact, they are no other than worms that know not how to do anything well, but are born only to gnaw and befoul the studies and labors of others, and not being able to attain celebrity by their own virtue and ingenuity, seek to put themselves in the front, by hook or by crook, through the defects and errors of others. Tansilo There are as many sorts of poets as there are sentiments and ideas, and to these it is possible to adapt garlands, not only of every species of plant, but also of other kinds of material. So the crowns of poets are made not only of myrtle and of laurel, but of vine leaves for the white wine verses, and of ivy for the bacchanals, of olive for sacrifice and laws, of poplar, of elm, and of corn for agriculture, of cypress for funerals, and innumerable others for other occasions, and if it please you, also of the material signified by a good fellow when he exclaimed, O Friar Leek, O Poetesta, that in Milan didst buckle on thy wreath, composed of salad, sausage, and the pepper caster. Chicada. Now surely he of diverse moods, which he exhibits in various ways, may cover himself with the branches of different plants, and may hold discourse worthily with the muses. For they are his aura or comforter, his anchor or support, and his harbor, to which he retires in times of labor, of agitation, and of storm. Hence he cries, O mountain of Parnassus, where I abide, Muses, with whom I converse, Fountain of Helicon, where I am nourished, Mountain that affordeth me a quiet dwelling place, Muses that inspire me with profound doctrines, Fountain that cleanseth me, Mountain on whose ascent my heart uprises, Muses that in discourse revive my spirits, Fountain whose arbors cool my brows, Change my death into life, my cypress to laurels, and my hells into heavens. That is, give me immortality, make me a poet, render me illustrious. Tansilo. Well, because to those whom heaven favors, 
the greatest evils turn to greatest good for needs or necessities bring forth labors and studies and these most often bring the glory of immortal splendor chicada for to die in one age makes us live in all the rest canticle of the shining ones a tribute to english women from the nolan nothing i envy jovi from this thy sky spake neptune thus and raised his lofty crest god of the waves said jovi thy pride runs high what more wouldst add to own thy stern behest thou spake the god dost rule the fiery span the circling spheres the glittering shafts of day greater am i who in the realm of man rule thames with all his nymphs in fair array in this my breast i hold the fruitful land the vasty reaches of the trembling sea and what in night's bright dome or days shall stand before these radiant maids who dwell with me not thine said jovi god of the watery mound to exceed my lot but thou my lot shalt share thy heavenly maids among my stars i'll count and thou shalt own the stars beyond compare the song of the nine singers the first sings and plays the scythern o cliffs and rocks o thorny woods o shore o hills and dales o valleys rivers seas how do your new discovered beauties please o nymph tis yours the guerdon rare if now the open skies shine fair o happy wanderings well spent and o'er the second sings and plays to his mandolin o happy wanderings well spent and o'er say then o circe these heroic tears these griefs endured through tedious months and years were as a grace divine bestowed if now our weary travail is no more the third sings and plays to his lyre if now our weary travail is no more if this sweet haven be our destined rest then naught remains but to be blessed to thank our god for all his gifts who from our eyes the veil uplifts where shines the light upon the heavenly shore the fourth sings to the vial where shines the light upon the heavenly shore o blindness dearer far than others sight o sweeter grief than earth's most sweet delight for ye have led the erring soul by gradual steps to this fair goal and through the darkness into light we soar the fifth sings to a spanish timbrel and through the darkness into light we soar to full fruition all high thought is brought with such brave patience that even we at least the only path can see and in his noblest work our god adore the six sings to a lute and in his noblest work our god adore god does not will joy should to joy succeed nor ill shall be of other ill the seed but in his hand the wheel of fate turns now depressed and now elate evolving day from night for evermore the seven sings to the irish harp evolving day from night for evermore and as yon robe of glorious nightly fire pales when the morning beams to noon aspire thus he who rules with law eternal creating order fair diurnal casts down the proud and does exalt the poor the eighth place with a violin bow casts down the proud and does exalt the poor and with an equal hand maintains the boundless worlds which he sustains and scatters all our finite sense at thought of his omnipotence clouded a while to be revealed once more the ninth place upon the rebeck clouded a while to be revealed once more thus neither doubt nor fear avails over all the incomparable end prevails over fair champagne and mountain over river brink and fountain and over the shocks of seas and perils of the shore translation of isa blagden of immensity from fifth life of giordano bruno this thou o spirit dost within my soul this weekly thought with thine own life amend rejoicing dost thy rapid pinions lend me and dost wing me to that lofty goal where secret portals ope and fetters break and thou dost grant me by thy grace complete fortune to spurn and death o high retreat which few attain and fewer yet forsake girdled with gates of brass in every part prisoned and bound in vain tis mine to rise through sparkling fields of air to pierce the skies sped and accoutred by no doubting heart till raised on clouds of contemplation vast light 
Leader, law, creator, I attain at last. Life well lost. Winked by desire and thee, O oh dear delight, As still the vast and succoring air I tread, So, mounting still, on swifter pinions bed, I scorn the world, and heaven receives my flight. And if the end of Icarus be nigh, I will submit, for I shall know no pain, And falling dead to earth, shall rise again. What lowly life with such high death can vie? Then speaks my heart from out the upper air, Whither dost lead me? Sorrow and despair attend the rash, and thus I make reply, Fear thou no fall, nor lofty ruin send, Safely divide the clouds, and die content, When such proud death is dealt thee from on high. Parnassus Within O heart, this you my chief Parnassus are, Where for my safety I must ever climb. My winged thoughts are muses, who from far Bring gifts of beauty to the court of time. And Helicon, that fair unwasted rill, Springs newly in my tears upon the earth, And by those streams and nymphs and by that hill It pleased the gods to give a poet birth. No favoring hand that comes of lofty race, No priestly unction, nor the grand of kings, Can on me lay such luster and such grace, Nor add such heritage, For one who sings has a crowned head, And by the sacred bay, his heart, his thoughts, his tears are consecrate alway. Compensation The moth beholds not death as forth he flies Into the splendor of the living flame. The heart athirst to crystal water highs, Nor heeds the shaft, nor fears the hunter's aim. The timid bird, returning from above To join his mate, deems not the net is nigh. Unto the light, the fount, and to my love Seeing the flame, the shaft, the chains, I fly. So high a torch, love lighted in the skies, Consumes my soul, and with this bow divine Of piercing sweetness, what terrestrial vies? This net of dear delight does prison mine, And I to life's last day have this desire, Be mine thine arrows, love, and mine thy fire. Life for Song Come, muse, O oh muse, so often scorned by me, The hope of sorrow and the balm of care. Give to me speech and song, that I may be Unchid by grief. Grant me such graces rare, As other ministering souls may never see, Who boast thy laurel and thy myrtle wear. I know no joy wherein thou hast not part, My speeding wind, my anchor, and my goal. Come, fair Parnassus, lift thou up my heart, Come, Helicon, renew my thirsty soul. A cypress crown, O muse, is thine to give, and pain eternal. Take this weary frame, touch me with fire, and this my death shall live, on all men's lips, and in undying fame. End of section 34